Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. The way of honoring the Lord is to know the word of God. And if we really know it accurately, then that helps us to know how to live it faithfully. And so part of that is through the mechanism, through the body known as the church. Now, when you hear the word church, actually, there are basically two kinds of churches. There's not a good church or a bad church. There's not a big church or a small church. I know big churches that are good churches. I know big churches that are not good churches. I know little churches that are good churches, and I know little churches that are not good churches. So bigger isn't better. Better is better, if you follow me. And if better is better, then where do we go but to Scripture? Now, for those of you that are coming into our church and you're exposed maybe for the first time, our series that we've begun is called The DNA of a Healthy Church. Sometimes you might hear that and you'll think, hmm, I wonder if they're having problems. The pastors usually will address problems that they would have with people or in the church. Well, let me assure you that every church is going to have problems because it's loaded with people and we all have problems and we bring them into the church. But realistically speaking, this church is a very healthy church. There are no dramas going on, so to speak. So sometimes when there's a sickness, we're going to take medicine. And other times when we're not sick, we often take vitamins to make us stronger. So often the pulpit ministry is to provide more a vitamin to teach you the word of God, to help you to be strong. And when you are, when those opportunities for sicknesses and germs to come in is fought off a lot easier. So we're teaching this. And one of the ways we do that is to once again go back to who we are and whose we are. And so we are the church and whose we are would be the Lord. He is the head of the church. He is the father of the family. And so to do that, we want to learn what scripture had to say. But to do that, we want to learn what is a healthy church so we know how to essentially play the game. You know that today is Pro Bowl, and I don't know how many of our folks are going or at the game now, but it's a very popular thing. I remember a story a while ago about a team that wasn't doing so well, and so the coach drew all these diagrams up on the on the board, and he sent them out there to play, and they lost. He brought them back in again. He then showed them films of the game, and they played the next game, and they lost. And then he took them back out again, and he showed them all different kinds of plays and really grilled them, and they still lost. And so the coach was so frustrated, he brought in all the players into the locker room this time. And he had them all sit down, and he says, obviously, you don't know the game of football. So then he held up a football, and he says, look, gentlemen, this is a football. And as soon as he did that, there was a guy in the back, an athlete in the back. He raised his hand and said, coach, coach, don't go so fast. Well, I don't want to go too fast for you, so we're going to spend a couple of weeks understanding so much what is not a football or the game but what the Bible has to say about the church. So I don't have to go back and reteach what I taught a couple of weeks ago. Let me encourage you to order our CD because I began with the first mention principle of the church. As Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, meaning that the church will never die and that it's an organism and not an organization. But now we need to talk about the birth of the church. And when you hear about the birth of the church, the birth of the church is truly the birth of Christianity. So how did Christianity get started? And I know that a lot of you are on your journey to discover what is authentic Christianity. And while I would love to say, if you want to see authentic Christianity, if you really want to see Christ in action today, then just look at the church. I'd love to tell you to do that. In fact, the Lord would want us to do that. But I hesitate a little bit because often the church is not a true representative of Christianity. And it often is not living out the life of Christ as Christ would. So to the degree that we understand scripture and to the degree we allow Christ who lives in us, the hope of glory, to be himself through us individually and corporately and then universally through the the, um, invisible church, to that degree we'll become more and more like Christ and we will be authentic Christianity. My opinion is that when the church was born, as you'll see uh, next week, you will find that I believe it was as close to the life of Christ as possible. And do I believe that uh, the church all over the world is now failing from Christ? No, I don't believe that the Lord is wringing his hands and pulling out his heavenly hair, so to speak, worrying about his church, thinking every church has gone to hell in a handbasket. 
On the other hand, he probably is saying there are those churches out there that need to go back to Scripture and look at it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and word by word to understand what it has to say. So while I'll teach you this and sometimes hopefully bring an application for your life, let me also remind you that the real teacher is going to be the Holy Spirit, and he will often teach through spiritually gifted people, the gifts of teaching from the Lord to you. But we're still all responsible to dig into the Word and get out those resource and reference books to help us to understand this. So I'm really appealing to your thinking for a moment that you would be the kind of person that says, you know, I just don't want to get three points in a poem. I don't want to have a mile wide and an inch deep. I want to go, I want to go deep. I really want to know the Word. Now, to do that, it requires sometimes, <clears throat> and I hope this is not an excuse, but it sometimes requires a little bit longer of a message, uh, not real long, but long enough to be able to set the premise so you can grow. Other times, we have to just drop it, but you do need to come back next week because sometimes a truth standing all by itself could become an imbalance if you just embrace that and you don't get all Scripture because Scripture must agree with Scripture. That's why you have Bible doctrines, ten doctrines. But that's also why you have what is known as systematic theology, which now takes those doctrines and they wed them all together so you can have the most accurate picture of Christ. So I know I'm laying the foundation of a little bit about what the church is like and how it began. Now today, we will not actually birth the church, so to speak, but we're going to do the preparation behind it. And if you recall, I used the earthly illustration. I don't know how accurate this is, but... I know some of it, and that is those of you ladies who had given birth, you know that when you conceive, there's that nine-month gestation period, and then you have that time that the the baby is being born, and we know it's actually born when it kind of comes, and I don't want to get too descriptive, you know. So being all that, we're going to talk a little bit about not so much the conception, because the church, I believe, was conceived in the mind of God, in the mind of Christ, way before man ever fell. And if you need plenty of scripture on that, I'd be glad to tell you that I believe the plan of salvation was already in motion in God's mind before man ever fell. And part of that is the church because we who are saved are part of that church, part of the redeemed, the community of the redeemed, we might say. But I want to talk a little bit more about the time of Christ and how the church is coming together. The reason I need to do that is because there's some issues doctrinally that some people, if they grab one verse, they take it out of context, they could um, go off and have improper thinking. So in time, I want to teach you the difference between the baptism of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit. I want to explain to you where it's found in the birthing of the church and how it transitioned as we see it in the book of Acts and then into where we are today in the baptism of the Spirit and the infilling of the Spirit. So we're going to talk a little bit about that maybe next week. We're going to get into it a little bit today. Are you ready for our journey for the amount of time that we have? I promise you that we'll be done by 2 o'clock, okay? Just joking. All right, let's go to verse 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. I talked a little bit about this the last time we got together, so I don't need to go as deeply until I get into the portion we didn't cover. But starting out, it was Luke who wrote Acts. He wrote Luke and Acts. In fact, he wrote uh, the majority of the New Testament as far as counting up the words, uh, although we think Paul wrote it because there are more books written by Paul, but technically it was really Luke. And Luke didn't write any more than what the Holy Spirit wanted him to, so it's underneath the divine inspiration of God. So it says, Luke speaking, Therefore, the first account, I, Luke, composed... Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach. You might want to circle the phrase to do and teach because, again, we're talking about the church. We're talking about Christ. The reason I like the phrase to do and teach, you might want to circle the word to do and in your margin write the word, I believe, what I think is important, what he did, which he mentored, what Jesus did. He showed them how to do something. So it's now telling me, perhaps as a dad, that I need to model what I'm teaching. So whatever I'm teaching, I need to live. Mothers, dads, older brothers, older sisters, those of you who are going into ministry, teachers, any person of influence that want to have an influence on someone else, you need to do it. And then it says, and what he taught. I think it's interesting through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that they're in a particular order. It didn't say all that Jesus taught and did. It said all what he did and he taught. Now, I don't want to split a theological hair here, but I'm wondering if maybe before we do the teaching, people need to do the seeing. And so maybe they need to look at who you are to watch how authentic it is so that when you're speaking, you have more clout behind you. So perhaps there's a lesson in there and you guys can do your own word study and do your own Bible study on the idea of mentoring and modeling, mentoring and modeling, okay, teaching and preaching and living. Verse 2. He said, until the day when he, Jesus, was taken up to heaven, that would be after the resurrection, it's called the ascension, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
Now, in a few moments, we're going to talk about the apostles that were selected during the New Testament days. We're going to talk a little about the Apostle Paul because he was selected a little bit later on. And you're probably wondering, what does this all have to do about the church? Well, listen very carefully. The church is built upon, in a loose sense, a hierarchy. Now, when you're coming from a Roman Catholic background, you think of, you know, the poop, the Pope, I'll erase that from the tape. Will you guys? I didn't, that, that's not a Freudian slip. I want the Pope and the bishops and all that that's under it. In the church, you have Christ, the chief cornerstone. Then you have the apostles as that foundation that goes with that cornerstone. And then from that, the church is built up. So you do have apostles that are involved in this. So you look back at this, it says, who gave orders to the apostles whom he, Jesus, has chosen. You might want to underline the fact that these guys were chosen. There are a lot of people out there, but he handpicked his guys. Now, what's important is that he didn't pick them from big cities. He didn't pick them from great walks of life. He picked them from an area that often was marginalized. It was the Galilean area, and the guys that lived in Galilee, they thought, can any good thing come out of Galilee? So in your own mind... Look at a particular of a, a part of our country that you think may be the less intelligent, the less informed, the people that seem to have less education, less connectivity, less respect. I want you to think about that area. And out of all the guys that Jesus would pick to be a part of his army to launch the church, he would go to that area to do it, which fits other scripture that says God chooses the base things of the world to confound the wise. And I'm so glad he chose to do that. You know why? Because I'm one of them. I did not come from a family that ever graduated from high school. Maybe that's why I say wrong stuff in a sermon. But the point of it is that God will use anybody who wants to be used. In this case, he picked his apostles. It's also important to know that when he's launching the church, not only is it built upon these apostles, these guys were the essential church planters. So they were handpicked of God. They had to fit a certain level of qualification, both in their heart and in their life, to be able to be the the template, humanly speaking, of the church. So that's why we study these things and we take more time. So it's not just, oh, let's start a church. It's kind of, oh, let's open up a taco stand or a sushi bar. You know, it's not like that. We're committed to Christ to really sense what are you doing in this world and what do you want me to do to be a part of it? And in this case, those that would lead. Coming back to it again, verse 3. To these, and you can draw a line to the apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering, again, between his resurrection after his suffering and his ascension by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days, underline that, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is different, I think, than the kingdom of heaven. I think this is all of God's economy as it would relate to who God is to people. All right, so it's the kingdom of God. All things belong to him. He's now teaching them about life and it's all Christ-centered, God-centered. Now verse four, gathering them, who? The apostles. So the Lord was on this earth. And now he gathers his guys together again. Now, for those of you that would like a little bit more, in the context of Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, there is such a movement of not having isolated teaching. There was this coming together, this gathering together. I'm thinking there's a couple of reasons. One of the reasons of the gathering together is obviously the more people that hear it together at one time, the less you have to repeat it. What's happening now in my personal life you don't mind me sharing, it just seems like the Lord is opening up a lot of doors with leaders on the island, whether they're Christian leaders, military leaders, uh, athletic people, all people. Listen, all I was never an athlete. I was never in the military. And why God is bringing these guys to me for leadership? And they're asking questions about, would you help me in their place of influence? So they're, they're together under leadership, but they want to know specific things of leadership. And I'm I am, I'm running from guy to guy to guy and, and email to email to email, phone call to phone call to try to do this. And I love it. This is my candy stick. I, you know, I don't do hospital calls well, so stay healthy, okay? But my point is I, I love working with leaders. Now, they are challenging. When you have leaders, leaders do not flock. They're like eagles. So they're going to fly independently, all right, most, most of the time. But if I could get them all together in a classroom or in my home or, or at Zippy's or somewhere and I could teach them, it would be better. Jesus gathered them together. He can say more to the group at one time. I think a second reason, and this is often overlooked, is when he gathered them together as the church is still in that gestation period, preparing for the birth, and that's going to be exciting when we see it, is there's accountability. I think there's also iron sharpeneth iron. When Jesus now leaves, the Holy Spirit will come. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the Holy Spirit is also going to use other people to make sure that the people are hearing the right thing 
You would love to be a part of our deacon meetings, just to be a fly in the wall. Our pastoral meetings, if I could use those two as illustrations. We have a bunch of leaders in both groups, and they are very opinionated. And they come in with great ideas. And they don't always agree on everything that we come together. But there's no fights. Nobody gets up and walks out. No, there's no, there's no tension of anger. And by the end of the evening, we are all in what we call the unity room. We may not be in the center of the room, but I don't care as long as we can get in the room. And often that's because while one person is speaking, the other one is now listening. And together we come up with your idea, his idea. Nope. Now it's God's idea. And it works out at least in the unity. And that works on both teams. So part of that is gathering them together. You want to see this watch as they're getting ready to the church, to put the church in motion here. And, and it is a common factor. All right. Verse four says gathering them together. That's a, to me, that's a very important thing when he puts them together. Verse six. So when they had come together, the idea of togetherness. Now it's really ramped up if you go to verse 14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves. So you have all one mind themselves. So the idea is together. Verse 15. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren and gathering a gathering of about 120 persons was there together. Now here's what I want to say. You'll notice how he commanded a gathering together. He brought them together. He made them come together. It's an active term. They didn't wander in when he announced. He gathered them together. By verse 14 and 15, they were staying together. Now go to chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, which, by the way, is the day of the birth of the church, they were all together in one place. So you see how the movement, I bring you together, now they're staying together, and now God can do some great things. If you go a little bit further, you're going to see how they're together again through the birthing of the church. What a beautiful story that is. So I would only say to you, let's stay together. Let's hang together. Let's hear these truths together. Let's share with one another. It's not me speak, you listen. It's we all speak, we all listen, but not all at the same time. Did you catch that? All right. So together we're gathering so we won't miss out on something. So he's gathering together and he commanded them. And you might want to underline that because he is now about to tell them something so important. It's like a military word commanding them. Do not leave Jerusalem. Now, if you recall, there's a time when he was saying, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. And here it says, don't leave Jerusalem. So all of a sudden we have a contradiction. Our Bible isn't true. And so let's become some other ism or spasm. No, what it is, is to understand again, systematic theology. Look at timelines. Look at the context. Who is there? Yes, we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but starting at a certain time and a certain event, because there are special needs that have to be met before we go into all the world. But it isn't get all of this juice from God and then stay there. So he's preparing them ahead of time with a little bit of a opening up of the veil that you're going to do something with this superpower that you're going to get. So he says, wait here right now. Do not leave Jerusalem. And he's commanding them to do that. I'm wondering maybe because some of them were ready to scatter. Jesus is dead. Now he's here. What do we do? Do we follow what he said before? What's happening? And so now there's a little bit of, uh, uh uh-oh, maybe we need to go visit somewhere else. And he's saying, no, you get together. Do not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Now, I love that, promised, which he said, you heard of from me. And what was it that he promised? That the Holy Spirit would come. He opens it up a little bit more in verse 5. He says, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the, with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. If you will give me this, I would like to open that phrase up when I get more into when the Holy Spirit comes and there's like tongues and there's like fire and all the stuff that's happening. I want to explain that when I get to it and I'm going to come back to this verse, but remember that it's here. He says, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the spirit. Not many days from now. I believe it was 10 days because Pentecost means 50. He's now speaking in verse three of 40 days. So the not many days will be 10 days, 40, 10, 50. Okay. Go a little bit further now, which you've heard of me not many days from now. So when they had come together, They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? Because they thought, hey, maybe he's going to set this whole thing up. Now he's the big man on campus. He can do great things. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So in other words, he says, let that bit of timing 
be put on a back burner. That's not what you need to know. This is part of the Deuteronomy 29, 29. There are things that you need to know. There are things that God only knows. You don't need to know this right now. So he does say this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, before I do the whole issue with the power part, I'd like to talk about, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I'm only going to take you to one other book in the New Testament, and then I'm going to come back to the book of Acts. So if you'll go just one book to the left, which is the Gospel of John, which we've been teaching verse by verse until I decided to go into this series at the beginning of the year. So we'll still go back to John. So people say, did he leave John? No, he just jumped ahead to John. John chapter 7. Let's look there very quick, quickly. John chapter 7. And you're going to see the inkling of the Spirit of God that's going to be released at the beginning of the church here. And so I want you to see where he's starting to, quote, let the cat out of the bag. And he says it here in John chapter 7, and uh, it's a neat passage of Scripture, verse 37. It goes like this. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out and he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. If you read it in context and you get the CD from when I taught that, you'll understand that Jesus is saying, anybody can come to me. All of us are thirsty. And therefore, if you come to me and you drink, you'll never thirst again. He explains it further in verse 38 when he says, He who believes in me, that's the coming and drinking, as the scripture says. And by the way, let's go back. You can come to Jesus and not drink. There are a lot of people that will keep coming to Bible studies, keep coming to seminars, keep coming to their Bible, keep asking questions over and over and over. They keep coming to Jesus, but they never receive him. Now you go to verse 38, you drink when you believe in him. As the scripture said, he who does this, once you do this, it says from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now what is he speaking of? Does that mean my, my, my water is going to come out of my stomach? What, what is, he says, but this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him, that means they're already Christians, were to receive in the future the spirit. For the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, ascended up to heaven. There wasn't that glorification when he finished that part. Now, if you will, go back to verse 38 when it says, from his innermost being. The reason I'm poking you in that direction or pointing you in that direction is to let you know that the spirit is going to be an inside job. I want you to know the spirit is going to be inside. Now, it's going to it, to start the church, it's got to be from the outside to the inside. But once you come to know Christ as Savior, it is an inside job. The spirit will be in you, and that's going to come later. You may now leave John 7, and let's go to John chapter 14, because he's speaking again. And this time, he's surrounded by his disciples, and here's what he says in John 14. Again, this is so important because now, even though I'm teaching on the church, I'm now teaching a little bit of the Holy Spirit. So you may want to get your pens out because in a moment I'm going to connect all those verses about the Holy Spirit and show you his ministry. Are you okay? Take a deep breath with me, will you? All right, I know this is heavy stuff, but it's important. Those of you that want a little bit more, when you go to Bible college, you hear the word ecclesia, okay? You hear the word ecclesiology, that's not important that you can pronounce those words. What is important is that you understand what it means. Ecclesiology. Ology means the study of. Ecclesia is the word called out, an assembly. And usually in scripture, it's referring to believers. We would call it the church. So ecclesiology is the study of the church. You are getting that these weeks at church. We are now teaching a little bit on the spirit. That would be called pneumatology. And pneumatology, ology is the study, pneuma, we refer to spirit, but technically it is the idea of wind or breath or air. And we're going to talk about why it's referred to as that this week a little bit and more the next time we get together. So you're getting both. Now, why is that important? Because we know that the church is going to be empowered by the spirit. We know that the church has a head, which is Jesus Christ. We know that all of this was designed by God. So you see the Trinity in the mechanism of the church. So listen carefully to this. So when you gather and you decide to go to church, it's not like, do we have time today? Do anything else better happening? Let's go to church. Uh, hey, that's a great church. They got good music, good parking, good this, good that. And so all of a sudden it becomes the greatest Christian club or rec center that we can go to that is all about meeting my needs. Now, is that what God wants us to have? So to understand that and to define that, we have to understand the seriousness of the birth. How many of you tragically would watch girls, young girls, women, young women, 
have babies, one after the other, after the other, and you're wondering, why are you doing this? Well, because everybody else has it. Right now in Hollywood, there's a big deal. Let's adopt as many kids from foreign countries. I think that's really great. But I wonder how much when they take that child in, are they going to work with that child and groom it? Or is this just nothing more than a human pet? This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.